Okay, we'll get started while people uh, trickle in. Um, welcome. My name's Matt McHenry. I'm a professor of ecology and evolutionary biology. This course is animal locomotion. Today we're going to do an overview of the course. Um, none of what I'm going to present is going to be on a test or a problem set, uh, so you can relax and enjoy the presentation. Um, I want this, I want us to take advantage of the fact that we're all together in a room. The last time I taught this course was during COVID and it was a greatly diminished experience from my perspective. I want you all to feel comfortable enough to stop me with your questions as we go through the material. I am recording the lectures. I often make mistakes in the recording. I fail to like click the microphone icon or whatever. So I will try to uh, make these lectures available online after there's always the possibility I mess something up but um, I don't think you're going to be reviewing every moment of the lectures but rather as you work through problem sets you might find it helpful to review certain portions of the lecture material as they relate to the problem sets I'll get into all the details of what I mean by a problem set and everything else uh, in a moment okay so what's this course about well it's about the mechanics and physiology of locomotion. We're focused, we're using locomotion as a focus to talk about mechanics and physiological concepts, a little bit of exercise physiology, a lot of mechanics, um, but it's basically, um, it's the area of expertise that I uh, operate in, that Dr. Um, Azizi operates in, um, and uh, it's, our, it's our field, and uh, we're very excited to be sharing it with you. The fact that it's mechanics or any particular aspect of physiology is somewhat arbitrary. What we really want to do is communicate how we do science and how we think about problems. Um, so locomotion is fundamental to the biology of virtually all animals, even something like uh, this humble sponge, which spends most of its lifetime stuck to the bottom of the ocean, does have a stage in life. This is the state, the planula stage, a larval stage, where it does disperse, it has cilia, it does do some locomotion. So even animals that basically look like plants, you wouldn't think would have a very exciting lifestyle, they do have a period of life that are rather exciting. Maybe not as exciting as this bluefin tuna, which migrate um, all over uh, the Atlantic, but um, they are also, even the humble planula is, I think, a fascinating uh, form of locomotion. Um, so this is an area of basic research. We're just curious about how animals work, how they function in their uh, natural environments, how they have evolved. But uh, all of those of us who do biomechanics in our department interface with engineers who have a more applied side of their uh, research. So we'll talk a little bit about some of those applications. Uh, those include the development of prosthetic limbs as well as the development of bio-inspired robot. This is like a human-inspired, very um, sort of intimidating looking robot uh, developed by Boston Dynamics. Uh, there are a lot sort of cuter um, animal-like uh, robots uh, that we'll talk about. Uh, but I just mentioned this that um, to point out the fact that even though we're basic researchers, we do have an area of our research that is more applied and we do speak the same language as a lot of engineers. Um, I'm going to use this uh, funny cartoon to highlight some of the um, aspects of a locomotor system that we're focused on. Uh, most of our attention is paid to the motor side of things. So after a brain or some other nervous system has made a decision about how to perform locomotion, all the sort of downstream events, all the the neurophysiology, the muscle physiology, and the mechanics that are involved in locomotion on that side of the control. And so those parts include, that's a little cartoon of a muscle there. Uh, that's a muscle. Uh, that muscle is hooked up to a couple of rigid um, bones. So that's providing a skeleton. And that skeleton is functioning to transmit the forces generated by the muscles so that those forces can act on the surrounding environment. And so that's in the domain of propulsion. So most of the lecture material is going to be on these components, how muscles work in greater detail than you were exposed to for 109, um, how the forces and the work generated by muscles are transmitted by a skeleton, and then finally, how those forces work on the surrounding environment. 
And so this is just a slide from Dr. Dr. Azizi's um, lecture. So, so Dr. Azizi is a muscle physiologist. This is his um, area of expertise. He'll tell you a lot of uh, the details on what determines force generation by muscles and the work generated by muscles. He'll get into um, how the architecture of muscles uh, is important to their, their, their mechanical performance and how um, they generate work. Um, and then finally, you know, a big theme, which I'll uh, sort of articulate in a moment, in physiology in general, biology even broader, is how uh, function appears across multiple layers of organization, you know, cellular, organ system level, whole organism level. And so with regards to muscle physiology, uh, you'll be able to see that. You'll be able to sort of consider actin myosin dynamics all the way up to how whole muscles work, and then finally how that's reflected in the performance of whole organisms. We'll talk in great detail about skeletons and how skeletons operate. And there we'll talk about um, basically thinking of the skeletal system, the rigid skeletal system that we have, that other vertebrates have, uh, that um, invertebrates have with ex exoskeletons, how forces that are generated by uh, muscles, such as the one detailed here, um, relate to the ultimate forces that they can generate, and what aspects of the geometry in between matter to like how much force you can uh, lift with a curl or something like that. But of course, not all animals have rigid skeletons, and in fact, we have soft skeletons in our own bodies. Does anybody know? what structures we have that are soft skeletons? I'm sorry? Cartilage? Well, yeah, that's a good one. Actually, I wasn't even thinking of that, but that's it's exactly right. So, you know, my nose uh, is not too droopy yet um, because <laughs> it, it, it does have cartilage that maintains its shape. But cartilage generally is used to kind of absorb work, like a shock absorber, or maybe to try to maintain some structural integrity before it degrades. Um, and not so much for transmitting forces um, like a rigid skeleton does, but we actually have the capacity to transmit forces without any hard parts in our bodies. You all have this organ. Anybody know? And I, I'll have this habit, this annoying habit of just like waiting for an answer. Makes everybody uncomfortable. Yeah. Tendon and ligaments, also great guess. Um, so tendons are essential for the trans. So, so tendons are the bit of connective tissue that, that are attached to the ends of muscles. And they, they give stretchiness to muscles. So for example, when you go running, your Achilles tendon absorbs a lot of the work generated against that tendon and it stretches the tendon and then it allows you to sort of spring off the ground. So it's quite useful for force transmission. So I think that's a good, that's a good potential answer. But what I'm talking about is something that it has like gearing to it like a skeleton. It has the ability to take the forces and transmit them and there's no hard parts whatsoever. So, so I, I like tendons. Ligaments are just like tendons but ligaments connect bones. Uh, also connected tissue. Any other thoughts? So a soft structure that transmits force, but has no hard parts. Yeah. A heart. Ooh, I like that. Yeah. So a heart. Yeah. Okay. So you all are coming up with answers that I wasn't anticipating, which is exactly what I hope for. Um, yeah. So you're absolutely right. A heart has no hard parts. It has the ability to generate pressure, you know, which is just force over area. So all of the uh, pressures in the ventricles, in the aorta, are all transmitted directly to the fluid. So yeah, so that is one that I wasn't thinking of, but is it, you're exactly correct. Yeah. Tongue. tongue, that was what I was fishing for. Yeah, so a tongue is, um, it's known as a muscular hydrostat. So just think about it. You can like manipulate food, move it around your mouth. You can, the tongue is actually very dexterous when you think about it. You don't bite on it too often, but you're you know, constantly shuttling food around. You know, it's very like um, highly controlled. It's got a sensory function. It can tell exactly where the food is. And it's transmitting force despite not using any hard parts. 
And, um, and so there are a large uh, diversity of animals that also do the same thing. They generate work. They manage to exert work on the environment, like this octopus that is working to open up the lid of this jar that it's stuck in. They're very clever organisms. And then it, um, octopus really have a tremendous ability to slip through small openings uh, as well. So there's some real advantages to having a soft skeleton. So skeletons come in both hard and soft uh, varieties, and we'll talk about that. Finally, we'll consider the forces generated on the environment by whole organisms. So this in the context of uh, human locomotion, terrestrial locomotion, uh, where the forces exerted on the ground, known as the ground reaction force, um, can provide insight into all of the musculoskeletal mechanics that created that force. Uh, that can be uh, quite essential. Um, more complicated mechanics emerge when you've got organisms that instead of acting on a hard substrate are acting on a fluid, such as this hummingbird here. So we'll consider the question of how animals fly, how fish swim, and that's in the domain of fluid dynamics and fluid mechanics. And uh, so I'll, I'll uh, cover uh, that material uh, when we get to it. So of course, that's all in the domain of what happens downstream of a control system. We will also touch a little bit on some of the neurophysiology around control, both um, sensory control from the external environment as well as the feedback loops that facilitate coordinated locomotion. So an example uh, that we see, I'm not gonna detail these graphs, I'm just doing a flyby on the graphs, but this is a graph of a gait transition. So horses, of course, have a variety of ways of moving. They coordinate their limbs with a different temporal pattern. Each of those is known as a gait, and they do their walking and trotting and galloping. Uh, this is all facilitated, of course, uh, by the nervous system. Uh, we'll consider how locomotion is guided by sensory cues. So here's the central nervous system. And at the end of the course, we'll consider how the central nervous system makes decisions about navigation, depending on sensory inputs, which of course uh, are a function of stimuli that emerge from um, the own motion that is generated by the propulsion of the organism, which emerges from the control. And so this goes sort of around and around in a control loop. And so we'll consider some of the dynamics of systems like that. So those are some of the particular themes that we're going to be covering. But like I said at the beginning, all of this content is kind of like an excuse to talk about how we do science in a particular area of research. And so a broad theme is the scientific method, how we do science. Um, we're also going to be employing the use of a consideration of forces. And so that brings us to Newt Newtonian mechanics. And there's a little bit of math involved in this course. I should say there's a lot of math, but it's actually all at a pretty um, uh, low level. That is, it's like algebra, a little bit of geometry. So we're talking like early high school, maybe middle school mathematics, that maybe you were thinking, I became a bio major, so I wouldn't have to do math. But um, this is not high level math, but you might have to sort of dust off some of the cobwebs on the math uh, for the problem sets of this course. Don't worry, the, the, the biggest challenge in the problem sets is just figuring out which mechanical principle applies to which situation. So it's very similar to the problem sets in an intro physics course where, you know, again, the calculations, well, it depends on whether you did calculus and physics or not. If you did just algebra and physics, it's like that level mathematically. But the real challenge, the conceptual challenge, is trying to figure out, well, which principles apply to this particular situation? Um, and and so, so again, there's some math, but it's not very high level. Um, it all emerges from uh, this guy here, so Newton. So we're talking 200 years ago. Um, the principles that we're all that we're going to be employing for the most part was all were all laid out. So uh, Newton did not do fluid dynamics, but fluid dynamics is entirely consistent with Newton's principles of mechanics. Another big theme has to do with scaling. The forces that small animals operate under that govern locomotion in small animals, like that planula I was showing earlier, are entirely different from a tuna or an elephant. Uh, um, a giraffe, et cetera. Forces are by and large scale dependent, and that has a big effect 
on how physiology operates, how locomotion works uh, for different organisms. As I mentioned, vertical integration, just like in all bio courses, is a big deal. So we're going to consider this scope, organ systems, organs, tissues, cells, uh, down to the level of molecules. We're also going to be talking, unlike 109, we're going to be talking about a diversity of organisms because we see a much greater sort of interesting array of forms of locomotion when you look across animal diversity. So we see you know, swimming animals. These are all vertebrates. We'll consider invertebrates as well. So um, the structure of the course uh, revolves around two major aims. So the first is just to become familiar with an area of basic research. When we give uh, lecture material, we're going to illustrate uh, some of the central concepts by drawing from the primary literature. Um, we'll talk about biomechanics, muscle physiology, and neurobiology. And then um, for the problem sets, an additional goal is to learn how to apply quantitative tools to biological systems. Um, this, uh, you know, biological investigators, we're using statistics. Some of us are using calculus, some sort of math all the time, but um, we actually don't teach a lot of quantitative principles in our courses for historical reasons, uh, even though as investigators we're doing calculations all the time. Um, in terms of how we organize um, the curriculum, we've got uh, problems that we pose in class. So we'll tell you about some area of research. We'll, we'll pose um, some sort of calculation. And we might toss it to you to provide an answer. So uh, you might have moments where you're sort of puzzling over a calculation. So having like a piece of paper uh, and a pencil would be helpful for those calculations for sure. Um, and they're going to be part of your grade, just a small part of your grade. We'll get to the um, proportion in a moment. Um, but to practice the administration of questions, uh, let's do answer this one now um, so that we can, I just want to see whether or not it works for me to pose a question in Canvas. And so what you should be able to do is in Canvas on your laptop or, uh, or maybe your phone, you go into the module section and there should be this, um, this practice, actually it says practice one, um, under the first module. Does, does everybody see this? Does not see it at all. Okay. Well then, hold on a second. That's because I haven't published it yet. Okay. Now I have. So if you refresh, you should hopefully be able to see it. Yes, okay. Raise your hand if you can't see it. Can't see it. Um, keep refreshing. Good, okay. Okay, um, Okay. so the, oops. So the question is, what is six minus two? So answer four. <laughs> Uh, and press return, hopefully you got four. Um, and then I'm just going to uh, process those, make sure that the grading is working. I, I'm not too worried about Canvas's ability to record. I just wanted to make sure that you all had access to it. So I think that's what I'll do is when we're doing these in-class exercises, I'll have it unpublished. I'll give you time to think about it to uh, provide your answer, and then I'll unpublish it when we're done. So, um, so let me unpublish it. Has everybody answered? Yes, okay. All right, so now I'm unpublishing. Oh, I can't unpublish. There are student submissions. All right, well, in that case, I will leave it open until the end of class. Okay, problem sets. Um, so 95% of your grade is based on problem sets. So let me explain how they work. Um, what we're gonna do is I will give you, oh, Dr. Zizi and I will give you a lecture, uh, a series of lectures in the course of one week. Okay, we'll give you a week's worth of lecture material. Then in the following week, we are going to post a problem set. So that problem set will have between three and five questions. 
we will pose both the question and the answer to that question. So then the point to the problem set is not to get the right answer, but it's to figure out how that answer was arrived at. So what principle applies, how um, are the parameters organized, and how do you uh, communicate the, your answer, basically your process to getting, arriving at the correct answer, how do you um, demonstrate all of that um, if you were to write the answer to a question. So we're going to provide you details on the formatting. Of, there's a video on Canvas that's already posted for basically what kind of formatting we want your answer to appear in. Um, and so you're going to have that week. So, okay, I'm going to give you a first week of lecture material, and then on Sunday night, we're going to post the problem set. Then all of next week, you can work on that problem set, just arriving at the solution in terms of how is the correct answer arrived at um, for all of the questions. Then on that Friday, that's a week from this Friday, we're going to have a test. And for that test, we're going to pick one of those problem set questions, and we're going to change the numbers. But um, And we're not going to give you a ton of time to, to answer that one question. Um, but what we want you to do is to, to do the calculation kind of for real uh, with the new numbers and then to show all of your work with 100% transparency so you get all the credit uh, for getting that answer. Uh, we're also going to add a few multiple choice questions that are just based on lecture material. So we might ask you about a particular study that we talked about, something to that effect. So if you're attending the lectures and you're paying attention, those multiple choice questions should be very easy. It's just like a check of general um, sort of attentiveness. Um, but the problem set is really the, the core challenge of that uh, quiz. And therefore, since that's most of this course, you know, most of what you'll be evaluated on is your ability to, to solve those problems. Okay, so, um, so we release them a week after the lectures. Uh, they're not graded, they're just for you to work through. And then we have the quizzes, and that's in class. And generally that'll be about half of our class period, is you, you all will be working on those quiz answers, and then uh, we'll have a mini lecture after that. Um, so you've got the multiple choice questions, and then one of the problem set questions in a modified form. Okay, so in terms of the value of everything, that's 95% of your final grade. I think we have nine of them uh, because we don't have one for the first week. Um, and then 5% is the in-class the in uh, questions, um, just like we simulated through Canvas. Um, so today's did not count, don't worry about that. All right, so just to remind you, so here we are in week one. Um, you're learning the lecture material, and then next week we release the problem set um, that's based on this week's lecture material. Uh, and then that just, uh, sorry, ignore these extra lines. This is from COVID. There'll be a week two of lecture material, and then following week two, there'll be the week two uh, problem set. So the week one quiz will, like I said, be on Friday, a week from this Friday, you'll have the quiz on problem set one. Um, we have textbooks that are optional. Uh, they can be a, a, a nice complement to the lecture material, perhaps a good reference for as you're working through the problem sets. The, the one on the right is the second edition. The one on the left is the first edition. I think the one on the right is a lot more readable. Um, the one on the left is more of a reference uh, guide. Um, our tips for the course are to keep up with lecture material, take notes, Bring your questions to our office hours. So, sorry, I only am now introducing Brooke. Brooke is our uh, TA for the course. Um, so you'll be interacting with uh, Brooke quite a bit. Uh, Brooke will have an office hour, as will um, I and Dr. Azizi. And so when um, usually um, he and I um, author our own problem sets. So if you're working on a problem set that's related to my material, you probably want to come to my office hour. Um, I can sort of step you through um, all of the details, um, give you some hints anyway uh, for my material, and then other, uh, otherwise, you know, if it's his type of material, then going to his office hour makes more sense. 
Um, and we also have Canvas, uh, the discussions open on Canvas. This is like, it's either, it either works and people get into um, participating on the discussions or they don't. So don't feel there's, there's no grading involved for the Canvas discussions. Um, but so it's like, it's great, it's there um, if you find it useful, if you, um, you know, we'll keep an eye on it to answer questions. But I think the office hours are far more valuable in general. Uh, for um, asking questions. Um, one thing I'll say is that when we do the in-class exercises, um, I'm sure this doesn't apply to anybody in this room, but there are some students who cheat um, uh, through poll everywhere. Uh, so if they're not in attendance, then the people in the class will share you know, answers to those who aren't here so they can uh, get credit despite not showing up for class. Um, please don't do that. You know, I'm sure it wouldn't occur to any of you, but just in case, if, it's, if you've heard of this maybe happening, uh, we will keep an eye on how many people are in attendance compared to how many people are answering the questions. If there's a disparity there, then we'll have to figure out ways of cracking down. We'll have to go down that whole road. It's just better if we don't do that. You know, so um, I would say just don't share what's going on in the class with people who uh, can't attend in the class. We do drop the, thir the three lowest scores on those in-class um, exercises. So if you can't make a class, you know, just, just take it as one of those, just so you won't get credit for that particular class, and then we'll just drop the lowest three. Um, any questions on the course? No questions, but yeah. Are the quizzes not familiar? Are the quizzes what? Um, does the material stack? Uh, not really. Well, uh, well, okay. So I take it back somewhat. Uh, so, so like for example, this week I'm going to talk about scaling, and those scaling principles will recur through lots of different mechanical systems. So that's an example of an exception where something that we presented early actually recurs, but. Um, generally, if you have a week on muscles, those questions will revolve around muscles. One of those questions might have to do with the scaling of muscles, which is drawing on an earlier principle. Um, and when we, you know, we might sort of step through in baby steps with the calculations early on, and then later on we'll kind of be a little bit faster. And so there is some history there uh, from week to week. But I would say in general, um, you're probably not gonna have to refer much back to earlier weeks when you're handling the problem set. Yeah. Yeah. Are there equation sheets? Or is it just a matter? Yes, we will provide equation. I forgot that we do that, but yes, we will do that. Um, yeah, we don't want people to have to memorize equations. You can have a calculator as long as it doesn't have internet access. So don't use like a cell phone as a calculator. If you have just like a dedicated old school calculator, then you can bring that. Although we do try to make the calculations simple-ish so that, well, I'll say just bring a calculator just um, as a security blanket. I don't wanna constrain us to a particular numbers, but in general, we, we, don't, we don't really wanna push the limits of your calculator. Let's put it that way. Other questions? Yeah. Um, I, um, I, so, so the question is, do I upload lecture slides? So after the fact, I will, after the lecture, but I don't want to do it before because quite often what I'll do is I'll pose a problem, you all will work on it, and then I'll go into great detail about the answer. So um, if I post it ahead of time, you know, it wouldn't really work so well. Um, so for that reason, I'll do it afterwards. Other questions? No? Okay. Um, okay, so that is what are we doing with that? Okay, so I'm going to start on the next lecture just a little bit. Okay, this is also not going to be on a problem set. But I wanted to talk about um, the scientific method 
in some general terms, just so that we're kind of all on the same page uh, conceptually. It's interesting, like all of us scientists, we talk about doing science all the time, but we don't generally have conversations about, you know, somebody's perspective on the scientific method. But as soon as you start to have that conversation with some random scientist, you'll find that people kind of have a different take on either what aspect of the scientific <coughs> method they're operating on or kind of like how they place what they do in the bigger picture. So I'm just going to say that this is my own little idiosyncratic view on the scientific method. And I welcome alternate perspectives, but um, just as we're going through and talking about the primary literature, I found it helpful over the years to kind of lay out just kind of like a, a broad picture for how I see science working, if that makes sense. Let me be more specific. Um, so in biomechanics, it's, this is like a weird subfield, but there's a bunch of people who are really interested in how fish um, eat other fish, and uh, Samantha's interested in this. Um, and, um, and it's kind of like, um, it seems rather esoteric, um, but fish are half of all vertebrates. They're incredibly diverse, and they spend a lot of fish, spend a lot of time trying to find things to fit in their mouths. And fish are not the most intelligent organisms. We have a lab full of them. And, they just will try to fit anything in their mouth that possibly moves, including like their own young. They just like eat anything. And so a lot of their sort of raison d'etre seems to be to just like try to stuff something into their mouths. This is what they spend a lot of time doing in our aquaria anyway. Um, and there are some like kind of spectacular examples of this capacity to fit things in the mouth of a fish. Um, when a big fish is trying to ingest a little fish like this one, uh, one thing that happens is they create this disturbance in the water that startles a smaller uh, fish. And so if I can somehow use some way of getting my jaws out in front of the body, then I have this little advantage to capture the prey. And so there is a group of uh, scientists that is interested in the mechanics of how that can be and also how that has evolved among fishes. You probably didn't know this was a field before today. Um, and so let's just consider the scientific method as it applies to this particular um, little subfield of science. So they're interested in fish. And in particular, they're interested in the front end of the fish, the bones in the fish, the muscles in the fish, and all the connective tissue. We talked about tendons and ligaments earlier. How do all of those little pieces coordinate uh, in order that they can exhibit this behavior, this explosive ability to capture something? And so critical to this process is uh, a series of observations. So um, let me just pause there. So I'm going to pause on my kind of idiosyncratic view of the scientific method. And I'd like your thoughts on where things might go next in this process. You've got a subject that you're interested in, fish in particular, particular part of the fish. You can observe something about the shapes of the bones, where the ligaments are, where are the muscles, how are the muscles activated, these kinds of observations. What's next? Yeah. Yes, a question. Thank you. Yes, I'm go that's going to pop up in, in a second. Yeah, right. I mean, all science is really fueled by this creative ability to pose questions. And um, like, huh, you really need to have curiosity about, well, how do these parts work together? How is it possible for the muscles to be activated? If you're a different kind of scientist, these things will likely not seem particularly inherently interesting. Um, they might have to be sold a little bit um, in order for um, the, the, what's valuable um, intellectually about that to be um, appealing to them. But anyway, this, you know, somebody who's interested in fish will find those kinds of questions uh, very interesting. What, else, what other sort of key ingredients are there to the scientific method? If I could ask you to not be texting during class, that would be helpful. Thank you. Um, what other kinds of components? Like when people say, you know, they, I mean, it sounds a little pretentious, the scientific method. Um, and there are certain words that sort of emerge when people are talking about the scientific method. What are those, what are those words? Yeah. Hypothesis. hypothesis is one of those. Like, right. So, so what do you mean when you say hypothesis? Um, you create your own sort of idea on how this works and try to answer your own questions. 
Very good. Yeah, exactly. It's like an educated guess. Like, I think it works this way. I'm not quite sure. That's my hypothesis. So hypotheses are really critical. What other components? Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Right, yeah, like drawing from the literature. Maybe you have, like, maybe you've been working in this area for years. You have your own personal observations, little things you've noticed about how fish eat things um, or whatever it is. You know, maybe you go scuba diving and you're really interested in how in certain habitats, like a coral reef, you see certain species come out certain times of day and you see other prey. Uh, you know, emerge at those times, and oh, maybe it's you know possible. So you start to get into community ecology, perhaps. Um, yeah, so sort of like a history ends up being very important to f helping people formulate hypotheses. And this, there's another big box over here that I'm gonna I'm gonna lay out, which also very much relates to the kind of historical pursuit of a certain area of investigation. What what is the ultimate product, at least this is my own opinion, the ultimate product of formulating hypotheses and gathering information over the years. Like, what is it that scientists, like when they say, aha, this is the thing that we've created from all of these years of thinking about something, what is that thing? And I would say that not all scientists will give you this answer. This is just my opinion. Yeah, sort of. Um, yeah, so it's sort of like a specific kind of conclusion that I'm looking for. So, like, what is it? Um, where, yeah, where is it? What is it that scientists return to when they're developing something? Say you've run a series of experiments, uh, and therefore we think these things. You know, what is? What might those things be? Data, um, sort of. I think I think of data as being. I think of data as being an observation, essentially. That sort of, in, I, I would put it in the same category. That data are observations that are maybe being uh, accumulated by a device, like an observation device, an instrument that's really good at measuring something that is outside our own capacity to measure. And so I would say that those could be observations as well. Yeah. yeah. Trends. trends? Well, no, again, I, I think I'd put that with observations as well. There's, there's definitely like a lot of, in the, in the domain of statistics and observations, I mean, uh, statistics and measurements um, that, uh, that, that I think I would, I would put all under that sort of category. Yeah, Rich. Exactly. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Um, so, um, so let me sort of shuttle through some of these other ones. Okay, so uh, what is an observation? So knowledge attained through the senses. Okay, ultimately, I mean, we're such visual creatures, we always want to see a graph, or maybe it's a table. But generally, uh, you know, we find visual representations to be the most convincing because we're visual creatures. Um, and so observations are generally represented uh, through figures and papers. And then there's your question, okay? You really need these observations to fuel your curiosity, formulate a question. Um, but ultimately, those questions result, or I would say this process results in theory. Uh, now, sometimes people think of theory as being just a mathematical formulation. I, I mean, Darwin had no equations in his books, and yet he developed the most important theories in biology. Um, so theory is more just a conceptual understanding, okay? So it's a logically consistent, so there has to be internal logic to it. As you sort of mull it over, you should be no, there should be no internal contradictions in a solid theory. So it has to be logically consistent, a uh, set of ideas that explain something in the natural world and that they can be the basis for formulating hypotheses. So these educated guesses that we, can that we can come up with about how something works should be consistent with this broad conceptual understanding. 
And if you, ha you can formulate theories about the world that are not scientific, so Freudian theory, for example, you, know, you can't measure the id, you can't measure ego. These are things that are provocative. Some people find them helpful, but they're not scientific because they're not testable. You know, religious concepts about how the world works are not testable generally, and therefore not scientific. It's not to say that those are the bad uh, you know, theories about how the world works, it's just that they're not the scientific ones. If you can't formulate a testable hypothesis, then it's not a scientific theory. Okay, so a hypothesis, if formulated in a very particular form, it allows you to create a prediction. So you can think of predictions as basically hypotheses, but they're very specific <coughs> manifestations of hypotheses. So in the area of biomechanics, we use Newtonian mechanics to formulate predictions that we can then compare to our measurements. And so you could think of you know, the broad body of theory as being mechanics, but then you have all these little subsets, like you know, the biomechanics of a fish head is a very like, you know, particular area um, of theory. And that body of theory could be used to formulate how fast a fish could capture prey how much pressure it might generate, um, how those pressures and forces relate to the activities of the muscles that are animating the body. And then what you can do is take um, a series of measurements by performing an experiment, or perhaps, if you're really clever, you can devise a way of manipulating your subject and then seeing how the subject changes under that manipulation and evaluating whether that's consistent with what you would predict given your hypothesis. Now, the thing is, is that you know, we say theory, it sort of sounds grandiose and fancy. There are a lot of bad theories, even the scientific ones. And so we're constantly reevaluating whether or not the theory holds up to scrutiny. And that's really what we spend so much time on. So um, when we do see a mismatch, as shown sort of schematically here, where our prediction does not look like our measurement, then you go back and reevaluate your theory. Um, and this is the domain of basic research. Okay, so basic research as opposed to applied research, oops, basic research is the domain where we, we seek to advance theory. Uh, that is a deep conceptual understanding for how the world works. And then you can use that body of theory to perhaps you know, build a robot or, um, or figure out how better to, uh, you know, you can potentially, not so much in biomechanics, but in physiology, you can apply it maybe to conservation biology. Like there are certain conserved areas, or uh, there are certain uh, applied areas of research where you can take a theoretical conceptual understanding and um, do something useful in the world. Um, whereas basic researchers are very much operating in the domain of the hypotheses and trying to reevaluate theory. So the scientific method operates through this process of hypothesis testing here, all in the spirit of um, arriving at better theory. And you know, one word we want to avoid here is prove. We never really arrive. Um, this whole process is kind of never ending, which might frustrate some people, but it never really um, you know, reaches a destination. It's a constant reevaluation of the ideas and a refining of our theory. And so a well-tested theory is the ultimate uh, product of this whole process, in my opinion. Um, and not all scientific theories are equal. We're throwing out uh, theories all the time. We're finding lots of hypotheses that don't match up against our observations. Now, among experiments, you have both you know, controlled experiments uh, in a lab where you try to just have one variable uh, change across your measurements. Um, of course, that's not always possible, and there are a variety of really helpful natural experiments where in the natural world you have many variables that are changing simultaneously, and you try to use uh, statistics to uh, figure out which ones are the most important. Um, in the domain of prediction generation, as I've mentioned, that's where mathematical modeling comes in for a lot of us, and then the evaluation between our predictions and our measurements is the domain of statistics. 
Um, so a lot of the observations um, and the uh, mathematical modeling that we'll be uh, focused on has to do with, uh, with mechanics and therefore that interfaces with engineering and Newtonian mechanics are really kind of the source of a lot of this. So in terms of questions, a lot of what we'll consider is, is you know, this being a biomechanics class, we'll consider, you know, well, what forces really matter in this system? You know, is this a force that, is it dominated by the fluids? You know, is it really the, the muscles that are driving this motion? As you observe an animal sort of move around, say the graceful gliding of a falcon, um, you know, just looking at the motion doesn't tell you what's determining that motion. You know, you might be able to formulate some wonderful uh, hypotheses based on an observation, but it's really mechanics that govern uh, these systems. And so what kind of force is a question we're interested in? And what model is predictive of what we can measure? And then finally, what are the implications uh, given this, this um, uh, refined theoretical understanding of the world? And so next time, I'll pick up on those three questions and start to apply them uh, to more specific uh, considerations of mechanics. And so I'll see you on Wednesday for that.